We're on a contract right now with Nashville Department of Transportation. Didn't just get magically walked through her door. Was this a $4.5 million award? Yeah, it's right there. You don't need the 8A to do business with the federal government. First position in the proposal is the solution. She is in a perfect position. And this is exactly what you want. Because you can be so busy or like, I don't have time, make time for it. So all my amazing GovCon winners, I have before me Fab, CEO of Blueprint Creative Group. Not only has she won government contracts, but she's also in the 8A program. So looking forward to hearing all about that journey. She's been in for about three years, but most importantly, Welcome to the channel, Fast. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. So talk to us. How did you get into government contracting and what do you sell to the federal government? So Blueprint Creative Group is a strategic communications um, firm, right? So, uh, and people are always asking us, government, what are they doing with marketing and communications, right? No one really ever understands that. So I find myself having to explain how much your government is interacting with you, whether or not you know it, right? So let's just think about something that everyone is going to find relatable. COVID-19, right? <laughs> All of that was marketing and outreach and communications, being able to deliver messaging, public health messaging, being able to modify and change our behaviors in terms of how we were interacting, right? Socially distancing, being able to influence us and motivate us towards uh, vaccination, right? That's all marketing. That's all outreach. It's all advertising. It's public health messaging. So that's in the health space. But even when you think about an enterprise like Department of Defense, right? Like Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, National Guard, people are like, what are they doing with marketing, right? They have to recruit, right? Part of our military readiness is being able to recruit um, for the combat force, but also on this side, the civilian side of the table, right? So all of that is marketing, is advertising, being able to instill confidence in America in terms of how, the strength of our military and our military power and, and how we're adopting new technologies, you know, to support our combat readiness. All of that is interacting with the public from a messaging perspective. We're working right now with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. People are like, how is that marketing? Right. Well, part of what USTDA has to do is um, it, because their focus is on infrastructure development in emerging markets. So why are we working overseas? Right. In emerging markets? Well, part of it is how we sell our goods and services to other markets. So there is a marketing component. There is an outreach component. We have to essentially expose our industry to them, to, you know, our um, international counterparts, because there's best practices that's shared. We have to be able to get our U.S. industry, our U.S. businesses with goods and services to sell to align their goods and services to the procurement opportunities overseas. So your government is constantly marketing, constantly engaging, constantly involved in outreach, not just at the federal level, your local government as well, because we work with state and local. So we're on a contract right now with Nashville Department of um, Transportation with their Vision uh, Zero uh, traffic safety contract. That's marketing. So click it or ticket is a huge marketing effort, as an example, right? Um, messaging that you hear around uh, high traffic days like Memorial Day, Fourth of July, no drinking and driving, all of those things. Your government is always, uh, and I don't want to say marketing because it sounds salesy. But essentially, that's what it is. It's, it's communications, it's outreach, it's engagement, it's in behavior change, it's in mm -hmm. you know, public good. All of that is the work that we do. So um, as you can see, I'm passionate about what we do. I love it. We've been in business since 2007 um, and we started off working with state and local. So that was kind of like our progressive channel towards the federal side. So getting a good grasp of how local governments work and then being able to build up past performance in that space is, you know, what you what we use to um, elevate us and amplify our capabilities on the federal side. No, I love this. And, you know, it's, it's very clear for all of you watching and listening your passion. And that's what's needed with the federal government. It's yeah, you can be transactional, like you're on Amazon. But when you have that passion, then people don't want to get rid of you. They want to keep you as long as possible until they can retire. They want to keep you as far as contractually. So before starting the business in 07, were you always in marketing? How did you go from what life was like, bam, 
I'm in marketing, I'm winning state and local contracts. Well, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So I've always been in marketing and I say entrepreneur at heart because I started Blueprint a couple of years after um, graduating with my MBA in marketing. So it's always been that path in, in terms of business, right? So um, came out of grad school and naturally went into what we were doing. I started off in another industry at first on the entertainment side. So doing entertainment marketing with um, uh, record labels and fashion brands and then transition on the government side about a year and a half into it. But yep, always been the case. And I love that because you didn't look back. So you went into state and local and then pivoted into government federal. What made you make that pivot into the federal side? Well, for a couple of things. So I, I still remember our very first contract was with the Georgia Department of Administrative Services. Um, and that was many moons ago. But the pivot came, obviously, as you're thinking about your growth trajectory, right? You're thinking about what more is available to you. Not that we're shying away from state and local, but for the type of work that we do is more so at the enterprise level because we come in and we develop institutional awareness, institutional brands. So we're not just on a tactical transactional level, as you mentioned. So our our job is to come in and, and that's where we integrate with program. We integrate with change management. We integrate with training and development, all that, because our job comes in on a strategic level where we essentially redevelop and modernize an agency's public facing, but also their identity from an institutional perspective. So we develop the strategic comms efforts and then the tactical side is however you use to deliver it, whether it's gonna be advertising, whether it's going to be some type of outreach effort, but the transition came in 2019 in terms of our growth trajectory and who we want it to be and what we want it to look like. And obviously, you know, government for one, can be the best customer you have and the biggest customer you have. So when you think about who's at the top of the food chain, going to be federal. And yeah. at what point did you decide, as well as how did you hear about the 8A program? Because, you know, I graduated from it. I'd heard about it through a customer. I had no idea about that program. So what made you go from getting state and local, pivoting, pivoted into to federal, bam, I'm going to apply for the 8A? Yeah. So the A can be intimidating, especially in this new context that we're operating in, where you know you have the social disadvantage um, part and things being on pause. But the A day can be very intimidating. You have a lot of small businesses who are like, "That's just too daunting." You know, I hear how hard it is to get into it, um, and I didn't use an outside firm, so I did it totally on my own. So. And it's funny how we came into it. And I have to give a shout out to the South Florida um, SBA district, Althea and her team. Yes. Because on our work side, we were actually, we brought them in to do, um, uh, we had a series of um, small business outreach efforts for the Miami-Dade County. That was part of a contract that we had. So we had um, Althea and her team come in and just talk to the small businesses like she does about the 8A program and the federal world. And I knew about the 8A, but I never really thought about it because when you think about the certification processes for anything, you're like, I don't want to fool with that, right? I just hear so much. And I'm sitting there in the crowd. This is our event, right? Our part of our small business outreach for the county. But I became the student at that moment. And I'm sitting there in the crowd. I was like, I mean, we can do this too. And that was the moment. So hearing Althea really likes, and Althea is a big cheerleader for the 8A program. And hearing her just say, hey, this is what it, you know, what it looks like. This is the process. These are the opportunities. This is your growth trajectory, you know, within the 8A space. And then also understanding from her how open the lanes are, because you, I, I don't know what the numbers are like right now, but there's very few businesses in the entire universe of who's participating in the federal program that are 8A certified, right? So there's just like you have, you know, for all the women owned businesses that's out there, very few are actually WOSB certified. So same thing with HubZone and everything else. So it was that moment to where I said, okay, we're going to go ahead and do our 8A certification. So I immediately went into that mode and it took a good 15 months. Um, we landed it towards the end of I don't want to say the end of COVID because I don't know when the end of COVID was, but we, we became certified November 1st, 2020. So half, almost half of that period was in the midst of COVID, right? 
And that was the part that was also kind of like, did we do it at the wrong time? Just because now the way you do business is changing because everybody's in Zoom. While our application was in place, the day of the shutdown, I was actually leaving Department of Education with the face-to-face -face meeting. The plan was we would be in DC every month, we would be networking, attending the events, doing the face-to-face -to, -face, to get in the federal world. And my very first face-to-face -face with the federal government, I'm getting back on a flight with this shutdown that's happening. So I'm like, okay, what does this look like now? Because everything you hear about is to get face-to-face -face with the customer, attend the events, do all of that. And now everybody's going to Zoom. So there were a few months into that where I'm like, okay, what's the timing off? Should we have waited to do it? So yeah. Did you end up getting an extra year? No, our cut, we missed it by less than 30 days, okay. the cutoff. I think it was like October 1st. So if you had been um, in 8 a October 1st, 2020 or prior, then you could get the extra a year. And I tried to advocate for it, but um, I think their mind's done with that. Okay. I just wondered, so for those of you, all my amazing GovCon winners, because of COVID, an extra year was added. So because I had suspended my 8A, we qualified. <laughs> So we got an extra year. So it was it was kind of cool um, to have that extra year because the thing is, you only get it for nine years. So talk to us about that because when we think nine years, like, oh, nine years, that's so much time. Talk to us about that. Is it a lot of time? How has it been over three years? Is your world changed? Are you on yachts? Like, <laughs> are we on, we're gonna go on a yacht together. That's what we okay. got. <laughs> okay, well. If there's a yacht that needs to come out of this, let me know. Somebody send me the bat signal. <laughs> no, that nine years is so short. Now think about it. To get your 8A in 2020 during COVID when everyone still worked from home, automatically you just lost a good two years. Automatically. Just because from a business development perspective, it doesn't happen overnight, right? You're, you're going to need a good year and a half, two years to fully ramp up. Now we had started in 20. 19 ish mm -hmm. before we were granted the 8a i was already starting to you know learn about the the federal world attending a lot of the webinars you know what as i mentioned i was in person with an agency that was before we got the 8a so i was already doing some of the pre-work before being granted the 8a i guess that was me just in, having the faith knowing that we would get the 8a i was like let's not wait till we get the 8a let's start to do those things now so that was, I would say, the advantage, not waiting to be granted the 8A because you don't need the 8A to do business with the federal government, you know, so to speak. And the 8A is not a magic bullet that's going to get you business with the federal government either. People think you get 8A and tomorrow, like your business just boom, you know, so it's not a magic bullet. So I knew that we, we had to do the pre-work, but to get your 8A in the midst of COVID, you lose a lot of time. So I I feel like this is really our first year in the 8A program, which sucks because we didn't get granted the extra year. That first year of trying to figure out how do we interact with the government from a staffing perspective, right? Because uh, there's a lot of staffing shortages on the contracting side from an um, uh, interaction perspective. We're not meeting in person anymore, which on a uh, benefit, it makes them more accessible. I'm hearing that they had never been, like contracting officers and program teams had never been this accessible before because everyone can jump on a Zoom, whereas before it was like face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Um, it's beneficial from that perspective, but now we don't have that face-to-face. -face. A lot of business is done, you know, informally, so we don't have that face-to-face. -face. So I feel like this is really the first year of the 8A program, so I wish somebody would hear this and say, you know, I feel bad for Blueprint Creative Group. I'm going to give them another year. Um, <laughs> So, um, but so it's been work from that sense. Um, in nine years to know that we have six years of that left, that clock really feels like it's ticking because as fast as this three years went, it's probably gonna go even faster, especially once we hit that five year mark or so. From what I hear, like those four years, you can just forget about it. It's like blink of an eye and it's done. And it, and it is, it goes by really fast. I remember when I got it and it, it's wild. Uh, but the beautiful thing is you can form joint ventures. So even after you graduate, you can form joint ventures as long as they don't change the rules. You can form them with other 8As. You can form them with ANCs, Native, um, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, all those kinds of, of things like that. So talk to us, when it comes to the 8A, have you been 
seeking more competitive 8A op opportunities or for more soul source or a mixture or you still like figuring it out i see i, I sometimes feel like it's double dot dutch like you're getting your rhythm or like dancing with the stars you got to know your partner so by the third episode you're getting tens you know it takes a little time so wh where are you in the type of 8a contracts that you're searching for when we do have a soul source that we got um Yay. with Private of defense, yeah. But it, it didn't just get magically walked through her door. You know, we still had to do what we had to do. And that's the I people think that, okay, 8A, they're gonna take all the work away from us because they have the certification, right? No. It was still a grind, still work, probably like an eight, nine month process, right? Um, but I still think that it was our merits, our capabilities, our know-how, and our strategic position that won us. I don't think any other firm for that particular opportunity came into the approach like what we did on paper, right? So the 8A didn't win it for us. We won it on our own. But obviously, because it was directed for 8A, that helped, right? So, but we look at everything, not just 8A, just because I, I personally feel like the 8A program is dwindling down. I don't feel like there was a lot of 8A set asides. Now in my industry, there's it's wide open. All the 8A firms seem to have come in together and they all, all exited the program at the same time. So there's very few 8A firms in our um, next code that's still 8A, which leaves all these open contracts available. So that's the opportunity and that's where we're really gonna drill down on um, in, um, in this new fiscal year. And we're also teaming up with a lot of the eight A's that recently graduated in the past year. Um, just because, you know, now all this work is left available and they don't want to lose it. Right. So we're teaming up. We meet it with everyone. Um, ANCs, we have some really good relationships with those ANCs. So we're always looking at opportunities to pursue with ANCs. So, um, and we don't believe that this is a, um, a single player game. So we come in to team on everything, wherever we can win, whatever it's going to take to win, um, we'll do it. I'd rather, you know, have 20 wins with partners than two wins with us by ourselves. And that's kind of our um, focus. Yeah, it, it is. It's better to have something than 100% a zero. Right. Nobody wants that. Yeah. Nobody wants that. And so for your contracts, let's take the one for Department of Defense. Is it that you have employees doing the work, contractors, are they on-site, off-site? Talk to us about that. And what kind of work are they doing? Is it design? Is it strategy? Is it what part, pieces and parts of marketing are they involved in? So we're providing public affairs support. So essentially public affairs is the public interfacing side of the agency, right? And how they communicate with the public, with stakeholders, with congressional leaders, with other military communities and personnel, um, with media, and even externally from a global perspective. Um, so we're essentially uh, staffing on site. Th these are our own staff. We have off site, which is our own staff as well. And so that's everything from graphic design, speech writing, um, communications, uh, event organizing and presentations for um, that department of um, defense command. And was this contract already in place when you learned of it? Okay, so the people who are on site, were they already there or no. be completely new? It's our, it's our own staff. We brought okay. in new. Completely new. Oh, that's exciting. It's five years? Yep, five and a half actually with the FAR option for the half year. Oh, good, good. So this is super exciting. So has the 8A got a sole source? Yes, there's there's lead time, but that often happens. These are talking bigger contracts. We're not talking, oh, I sold some pens on Amazon, which is still great. And you can still sell pens to the federal government. It's just that sometimes when we're talking bigger opportunities and speech writing is key, you want to make sure you can trust a company. You don't want just anybody writing a speech or going on chat GPT because they could do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's great that she's there because she's passionate she's a thought leader and so i'm pretty confident that they went with her because of the most important piece of every single one of our businesses and that's us the business owner that's what sells it they fell in love with fab and they're like okay she's amazing so clearly our team's going to be amazing and then as time goes on there's going to be more opportunity for more work. But I, I will also say our selling point with that was the team that we presented for it, right? And their capabilities, right? And were they really honed in? Um, so that was big. And I think that's where our approach was different because 
remember, we don't, we're not just a communications and marketing firm. Most firms in our space will go in from a tactical transactional perspective. We're looking at it from a strategic. So if I were this um, DOD command, right. And I'm thinking about the next five years of our command, what do I want it to look like? So that's our approach too, from a strategic planning perspective. And that's why I think that we were successful at it. So thinking about the customer, what their needs are, we look at everyone's strategic plan. So we understand what their strategic priorities are in that plan over the next five years. We do a really good digging on what their future is supposed to look like. What are some of their KPIs? And then we address that in our approach as well. And I think that's where um, our selling point is. Um, so, I mean, I like to say that um, our uh, pudding, our bread pudding is that we outsmart our competitors. That's kind of like how we come in um, when we're responding to proposals, right? We we like to think very smart because we're not thinking about, um, you know, this is what we've done for so-and-so and this is our work and here's our accolades and here's our past performance and here's this and here's that because a lot of times that's what proposal responses look like, a big old brag book. And it's almost, it, it can be very successful for you because if you have enough to brag about, depending on who's on the source selection team, they're like, wow, this is impressive, right? But there is that sometimes that one person on that source sele selection team who's looking for an actual solution mm -hmm. and they're reviewing your proposal with that solution in mind and not just your brag book of what you can do. So we come in, we, yeah, we'll, we'll put our brag book second, but our first position in the proposal is the solution. So we come in and we try to think strategically, how can we solution or idea, ideate their problems? And that's where uh, we like to stay in and try to win. Yeah. And then part of what makes you a success and will continue making a success because you're a thought leader. Because there's thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands of companies with a cage code, but then there are the agencies that want a thought leader. They're not just looking for, oh, it's the same thing that we had before or I had at my other command. So it's great that you do that. Are, for this opportunity, did they max out the ceiling? Was this a $4.5 million award? Are you able to share that? Yeah, it's, it's right there. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Which is awesome and hot off the presses. There is talk in the new NDAA for fiscal 24. They will increase sole source to eight. Yeah. So that's super exciting because what would be interesting is with your contract, what they could do is option year two, void it, give you a new one for eight. That's interesting. And then it gives you more time. Yeah. You expire in six years or you can have them do it option year three because you want to extend it out way past or, 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 or maybe even four years, right? You want to take full advantage. That's something that we did. So we have a client that we've been with for over 10 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, I had been hearing that there was like a seven or seven and a half million ceiling that they were toying around. So just to see that it was eight, that's great. Yeah. You have so much runway. I mean, yeah. everyone listening, she is in a perfect position. And this is exactly what you want. Because as Fab has said, an 8A is not a magic bullet. No set aside is, is what you offer and you have to keep working it. Now, if she wanted to, she could be like, hey, this is good. This is the life I want. I'm good with this one contract. And that's cool too. But it's about she can take that and the sky is the limit. I mean, I know I recently saw something I want to say was for the VA where they wanted this whole strategic plan. I think it was around a hotline. I don't know if it was around depression or mental health. Line 88. It might have been something and uh, and, yeah. and it's like, it's cool because I have no background in any of this, but it's cool to see these opportunities come up and it's exciting. It's cool too, because like your face lights up, like you could tell how passionate you are. And I just, I just love that. What other type of agencies are you looking to get work with? Yeah, so we um, actually want, it's non 8 a but we have Georgia Army National Guard. So we're looking to do a lot more work with the National Guard, um, not just with Georgia, but with all the National Guard. So we pursue everything with the National Guard just because there's a lot of modernization that needs to happen at the National Guard. Military-wise, recruiting is challenged just because we're in a different environment today, right? Who we're recruiting looks different than the military was recruiting 20, 30 years ago. 
right? We're not in a wartime, right? So, and that has some type of impact on recruiting and people's desire to want to join the different branches of the military. Plus with the way communications landscape has evolved, you can't just do radio or TV these days, right? Now things are programmatic, digital advertising is streaming, Hulu and Netflix. So it's become more complicated and how people joined the different branches of the military then was because you had a family member that was connected, right? So you had that family connection connection. Well, those people are now in their latter years or they're gone. So the kids today no longer have that person that could talk about their years in Vietnam or, you know, other. Yeah. So even, you know, Desert Storm, you don't have, you're starting to lose some of those stories. So um, the, the kids today are not connecting with that. So how do we look at that differently. What I'm starting to see that I like a lot of with the National Guard is that they're starting to do these NIL deals, name, image, and likeness deals, where they're tapping into, you know, now with um, NCAA allowing um, athletes, you know, to monetize their brand, they're tapping into that. Um, I'm starting to see some National Guard stations um, do more programmatic advertising since everybody's like watching on their phones and streaming. Um, so I'm starting to like that. But what our solution is that I don't think is being considered yet is that it's not an advertising solution anymore. I've seen the military, Department of Defense, National Guard, everybody. One contract could be a $60 million advertising contract, and that still does not solve the recruiting issue. So it doesn't matter how much money they pour into it, advertising is no longer it anymore. There's a total rebrand, a refresh that needs to happen on what it looks like to serve regardless of whether it's, you know, National Guard, whether it's Air Force, but that story, that narrative looks totally different now. These kids are in a different environment to where how they look at college is different, right? Their appetite for entrepreneurship and innovation is affecting, you know, what they want to do with their careers. So the story needs to be modernized in terms of what the, our branches of military looks like. And that's the work that we're wanting to do. Be that agency that can help modernize the face of the military and not spend $60 million in one advertising effort that still is not solving our need. We yeah. save you money is what I'm saying. Right. And it, it is, you know, they, they do. They need to soul source you more contracts, give you contracts on this because there was the point in time for a while, the army had a NASCAR. They sponsored and they finally did away with that. And I can only imagine the size of that contract. And, but it's, it's just thinking in general, how we consume as people. It's, it could be because of something on Snapchat. It could be because of a celebrity or somebody we follow. You know, like Tabitha Brown, like I'm on the verge of buying every vegan thing that she ever <laughs> chooses and I'm not even vegan. Vegan, right. <laughs> Tabitha Brown, you know? Yeah. And so the fact that you're really tapped into that is key because there's a lot of people that that are, especially what I have found with some that are in this space, they act more like a staffing company. So they may have PR, they may have some marketing-ish positions and it's just them putting people into positions and they may call themselves a marketing company but that's that's what i've come across with the few that i've known and there was another one who i knew that was more in your lane uh, and started out outside of government so as you per you progress in this 8a program there's going to come a time where you may want to mentor someone is that of interest to as far as like your exit is it to sell is it to mentor is it to just go to the moon what are your plans throughout the next six years well my business is not based on just the 8a program right so i'm not developing a strategy just because the 8a has ex um, expired obviously we have um an exit plan that we'll focus on for the 8a side just like every like you and every other 8a from prior to us you always think about what your out is you know who are, who are we going to team up with who are we going to hand this off to so we'll develop that but yeah so but the company is not built off of the 8a and i say this because the 8a program is challenged right now you know it's being challenged at the supreme corporate level and we had to go in and prove our social disadvantage and it's because of this idea that there was this perception that these certifications is a, is a walk in the park that these certifications get you the contract and now you just kind of like you know, you don't have to compete anymore. And so there are those who are like advocating against it because they think that now with my 8A that it excludes them from competing, 
right? Because I'm going to get all the business negative, you know, negative. The 8A, if you think about it, it's a separate business plan than how you pursue your BD anyway, because we have to focus just on 8A targeting opportunities. But in addition to all the other work that we could be pursuing, just because the 8A is a different lane, right? So, and it's not a, a, a walk in the park. It, it takes still a lot of strategy and a lot of nurturing, a lot of business development, capture, planning, and all of that to win these opportunities. So I say that because I don't want others to be discouraged by the 8A process because now there is a challenge in that. And even when I think about it, it took us almost about 15 to 18 months to be awarded the 8A. I find that a lot of firms drop off in the first round of that, right? Because they're going to come in and they're going to ask you a lot more documentation. We, I think I went through like maybe two or three rounds of that where the list kept growing. There's like 30 things that they need and there's 35 in the next request. And a lot of businesses will tap out from that, right? Because they're like, this is too much. It's not even worth it. But you you have to, you know, play to win. So that's what they require. Then that's what they require. And you have to play the game. You, you know? do. You yeah. definitely do have to play the game. And, you know, I commend you on submitting your letter. That, that was something that was required when I first applied for the 8A in 2011. Everyone had to write a letter that provided evidence support of being disadvantaged. And so walk us through that. How, because for those who are currently 8As, many, probably all of them, <laughs> well, maybe not all of them, many, depending on how they got in, are being asked to write a letter. And then those who are in the middle of going through the process, for instance, there's someone I'm mentoring right now who's going through the 8A process, more than likely this person will be asked for a letter. So some people have been freaked out because to Fab's point, some people are like, oh, one road bump, I'm out. It's like, okay. So how long did it take you to write the letter, send the letter and get the letter approved? So let me just start off. I didn't have to provide a narrative coming into the 8A program. No, so afterwards, that, like when you were in it. No. I thought you wrote me and said you just submitted your letter. Well, that was because of the Supreme Court decision. That's three years now. That's But they never required anything like that prior to with having the 8A. No, no, I understand. You recently wrote a letter. Yeah, yeah. We right. recently wrote right. yeah. right. yeah. My, the, the point I'm making is, yeah, yeah. When I applied in 2011, it was required that everyone had to write. Everyone had to do that. So yeah. the reason you had to write a letter is because of the case in Tennessee. Right. And so therefore, the thing is, it's freaking some people out. Oh, absolutely. So how long did it take you to then write the letter and get it approved? Because some people are thinking, oh my uh, gosh, you know. I did it immediate because okay. I, I, when the decision was made, I knew we had our 8A in the pipeline, the, the sole source. So I knew that there was a possibility that it was going to um, interfere with that. And then my South Florida district office had already given us some heads up like, hey, if you don't have any 8A um, contracts on the table, you can wait until the SBA reaches out to you. But if you do start to gear up for that, you know, because they wanted to prioritize those who had contract actions that needed to be done, right? So that there was not a backlog. So they prioritized that first and then let's get those people out the way. And then for everyone else, then you can, we'll, we'll let you know when you submit that. So the moment that I saw that I already, you know, I, I had enough recollection of stuff that I, I started typing it away. So I did that immediately. And um, I could say that they reviewed very quickly. I think I got a response in like 24 to 48 hours. Oh my gosh. And listen, it, Dove Gun Waters is amazing. That is amazing. If you follow the format. Okay. Maybe if you don't follow the format, it takes a little longer, but that's why you have to read the materials they give you and follow the format exactly. So I made it as easy as possible for them. Followed the format. They said no more than three examples. Don't give us 10 pages. I followed the format exactly with the who, what, when, where, how, and why. I love that. I love that. And then another thing and benefit of the 8A program is you have, you know, business opportunities specialist. You have a, a, a BOS assigned to you and you are in the South floor. You're, you're, and also for those of you watching, you're assigned a region, but something to keep in mind. Usually it's based on where your business is, but there are some 8As that I know where they may be in the DC area area, but their BOS is in Idaho, Utah, Oklahoma. So just putting that out there. So where is your BOS? Are they Miami, Tampa? Miami. So they're in Miami because they're very accessible. And do you, and, and talk us through that because some people think, oh, 
I heard this BOS is magical and they're gonna get me contracts and they're gonna help me grow my business. What have you found they've really helped you with? Well, you have to really get to know your BOS. So I mentioned that, you know, I decided to pursue the 8A because Althea came in and presented at something that we were organizing, right? So I already knew Al Althea and then Amy Perez became my BOS. So you have to interact with them. It's, they have, they're managing probably 200 other businesses, one person or their office. So you cannot wait for them to reach out to you. So you have to be the one to proactively reach out to them, help, help them understand your business and what your vision and your goals are. And then when they respond to you, uh, respond immediately. So I think that's where, um, I came in. So staying regularly connected with Amy. Um, and then when they do local things, I'm, I try to show up as well so that that FaceTime is there as well. So being present there. Now, if your um, BOS is not in your local market, that could be a little challenging, but that's part of the business development process. If you got to get in a car or get on a flight, that's what you have to do. But yeah, so your BOS is not going to win your contracts for you. You still have to do the job, but they're there when you have questions. So like with the social narrative, you know, it was my BOS that communicated what the process looks like, what the format looks like, you know, when you're doing a sole source uh, or a direct source or something, the, uh, that program office is who's connecting with your BOS, right? And your BOS kind of like relays that information. So being able to have a good enough relationship with your BOS to where you can ask them questions, you know, how does this work or what's expected of me or et cetera. So um, that helped out with, it, with that. It's, and then also when we were doing some of our marketing and outreach, just in general, my BOS knew of some of my activities as well. So it helped to kind of keep in line, like these are best practices or no, nah, that's not best practices, you know? So it helped from that perspective. That's really good. And I found having a good relationship, you know, definitely helps if you can. I mean, there are some, I know of an 8A firm in the DC area and their BOS is contact is like some generic 8a at sba.gov yeah. kind of email address. So I get it if one can't, but do the best that you can. And then there's also training. This is another thing that I'm not sure if firms realize, but as part of the 8a program, you got to go through training. So talk to us about what is this training? Has it been beneficial? So I signed up for everything, um, especially in the first couple of years. So I did all their trainings. Um, whatever I felt like I needed to meet some gaps. And then there with the seven J there's trainings with that as well. So there was, um, fed, fed biz speed or something like that. Mm -hmm. Did um, SBA sponsors or cohort where you go to a three month type eight, a cohort where we met monthly and we had some assignments. We were assigned a coach. It was like a small group. So like 10 or 15 of us. Um, and we would go through this programmatic approach to where our coach like took us through steps. So that was very good. And that was a year ago. And I still connect with the coach to let him know what some of our wins w were. So yeah, so I I've done that. Um, the catalyst center is something that's sponsored by the SBA. So I'll do their um, events. And because of that, I've connected with their director and she's given me some one-on-ones. Uh, she's looked things up for me on, um, some of their tools where they can find some opportunities that we don't have subscriptions to. I even do stuff like with Maryland PTAC or at Maryland apex now. So I don't care where it is. If it's something that I can benefit from, whether it's in Maryland, whether it's in a different state or our market because Catalyst is in uh, Catalyst is in Alabama, I think. Um, but I still uh, do a lot of their things, so I just fill in those gaps, and that I think that's the difference too. I think as a business owner, you can be so busy that you are like, I don't have time to do all of these. But um, if it's going to be beneficial, I make time for it. Which is great because there are thousands of companies in the 8A program. Who knows how many go through training? And I know a small percentage get contracts, get 8A contracts throughout their nine years in the program. So your success is only going to continue because you have contracts. You are looking and already taking the approach to go well beyond the 8A program. You're going through these trainings. You're taking full advantage. And the thing is, for those of you here, these programs are free. They're part of the 8A program. 
So these are some of the benefits that you get. And even after you graduate, like I still have access to a couple of these programs because I'm woman owned. And as you mentioned, the P-Tax, there's a lot of free resources, SCORE, APEX. There may be some uh, women's center. And that's another thing. Even if you're uh, not a woman owned business, I believe those centers will help you too. So don't think if you don't fit that profile that they can't help you. It's about filling the knowledge gap because it's, as you said, sometimes, you know, we're in the business or on the business, but you also have to grow. And so I'm just, I'm so just impressed and I'm, I'm so excited because before you know it, you're going to be like, I got $200 million in contracts and you're hey. in all over. I'm, you will. You rang that. You will, Fab, because you're exactly what an agency needs. Because too often, because I've seen it in these little 15 years, people are just interesting as business owners and they, you are not, you are the real deal. And that's why, well, you know, well I thank you too, because like even coming into the AA, you know, I reached out because I reached, that's how you and I connected, you know, hey, because I've heard your name around the South Florida office as well. And, and I think that you went through a couple of their programs and initiatives. So, um, and I reached out, I don't even know how I found you, but probably blindly. And you were responsive. You met with me and we chatted and talked. Um, so, so those are the, the things that you have to do, not being afraid to, to reach out to someone that's already been there um, because you bring a wealth of experience as well. So I thank you for that because like um, you gave some like real world, like real talk conversations around that um, and then just shared how you navigated a lot of those things. Um, and, uh, and I don't know how different the 8A world was when you started versus how it is now, but it helps to get those perspectives as well, because s some of the simple things that they always, uh, tell you to do in, in BD is different now. Like these contracting officers are, sh are short staffed, right? So their availability looks totally different than it did just five years ago. And being able to navigate that looks different and it requires you to approach it differently yeah being adaptable is important yes being adaptable is super important and i can't thank you enough fab for being here for anyone who wants to reach out to you what is the best way for them to connect with you how maybe they have questions maybe they want to partner how can they best connect with you yeah linkedin is so much easy because my inbox gets so clogged so when it's a linkedin it comes on my phone um and I'm able to get those alerts. So if you look for me, Fabiola Floraville at LinkedIn, um, that's an easy, quick approach. Um, unless you're a contracting officer <laughs> and you need my immediate attention, you know, but yeah. So, um, I'm, you know, people reach out to me a lot anyway, um, on LinkedIn. So I'm able to just like from my phone, just like message quickly and all of that. Which is awesome. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for being here. This is just amazing to hear, especially you have someone who's three years into the program. I don't know what else to say. Y'all already know. Your minds are blown like mine. So make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification button, share. If you're not in the Facebook group, y'all get in the Facebook group. Check out profitablecontracts.co backslash free for your free uh, capability template. And as always, don't forget, everything is possible. Take care, everyone.